All right, everyone, welcome back to the Small Business Experience. We have a great episode for you today. Ian and I are here at the front end of the episode to, to give you a little intro about it. And uh, Ian, how are you doing? Doing fantastic. Thank He's you doing fantastic. Me. We're going to give you guys an intro to the non for profit we have on this episode for you guys to watch. And then if you want to stick around after, Ian and I are going to get into some of the topics of the week. Uh, including the increase in gas prices and inflation, and it, we're also gonna we're gonna talk about this little this little farm we have on our on our website shopsb.co where we have recently gotten some bison from. Yeah, so, I've, uh, I'm a big fan. Yeah, so if you want to stick around after the interview, uh, please do so because we got some pretty cool topics for you guys. Sweet. But so you guys are gonna watch an episode or listen if you're on our podcast apps to an interview we did a few weeks ago uh, with Brave Hearts for Strong Minds. It's a not-for-profit charity in our local area, and I think we t- say this in the episode, but they're celebrating their 10th year anniversary, which is a pretty big milestone for a not-for-profit. And so basically, what this not I keep saying what this not-for-profit does is they will fund college educations for children who have lost their parents. So basically your donations will go to 529 plans. And if you don't know what a 529 plan is, we did a video on it, but it's basically a, a tax-friendly savings account for tuition. Mm-hmm. And tuition keeps going up, so it might be a good thing. <laughs> but um, Ian, do you wanna share a little bit more about the foundation and then we'll let people yeah, I think I believe in our interview, um, we were told that they donated over five hundred thousand dollars, which is really cool. Um, one thing that they, that I didn't think about, I feel like a lot of times when you see people getting um, donating money to college students, it tends to be when they're on the precipice of college or they're in college. And uh, an interesting thing that Brave Hearts for Strong Minds does is that they donate to younger kids, put money in their five twenty nine plans. And then, obviously, 529 plans, you can invest in different types of investments, depending on what kind of 529 you're in. And they are able to invest that money and grow the money by the time they do decide to go to college. And so, obviously, it's something that's born out of a very sad event. But I think it's really cool the way that they go about um, trying to make something that's obviously terrible, but like a bright spot um, in these people's lives. So yeah, it was a great interview. It was really interesting to hear about. I always like when we do the not-for-profit interviews because yeah. um, there tends to be like a really good story that something's born out of. Um, and it's really interesting to see how somebody kind of carries that, um, carries the weight of that and tries to carry it forward. Um, and in this case, it was it was born out of a tragic accident as well. Um, but rather than dwelling in the sadness of something, somebody decided to create something kind of cool and uh, special to pay it forward to somebody else. Yeah, and we talked about this in our episode with Mark Gerber, the FBI agent, which is one of our previous episodes, and we talked a lot about legacy in that episode, and something about the way you were saying that just spoke to me a little bit, because it was, this is basically what Tom Riley's legacy is. Mm -hmm. He left behind, which is uh, the man that Brave Hearts for Strong Minds was born after. And uh, it's it's just a really cool thing to think about the legacy that people leave behind. And this was one that really the people who put this into practice did for him. And yeah. it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's great to leave a legacy behind. And one that does is going to continue to do so much good for people going forward. So guys, uh, stick around for this episode. And then if you want to listen to Ian and I talk after, feel free to stick around. We'd love to have you. And if you're new joining the channel, thank you so much for coming to watch this episode, and we hope you stick around. Yeah. All right, thanks, guys. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Small Business Experience. Today, we are lucky enough to have the Executive Director for Brave Hearts Strong Mind, Andrea Wentzel. Did I get it right? Yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> we practiced before, everyone, just to make sure I got it's, name right. And just so you know, it's Brave Hearts for Strong Minds. Brave Hearts for Strong Minds. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so very lucky to have you, and we're happy you gave us the opportunity to set this up with you. And we were really interested to hear about the foundation, but I always forget, Ian, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. <laughs> so Happy to be here. I know, I always forget to introduce him, but he's a very valuable member. But um, yeah, we're excited to talk to you tonight and kind of get your take on why Brave Hearts for Strong Minds started, where it's going. And we just talked about something you guys finalized, and we'd love to hear more about that. But I guess the best way to get it started here, so everyone who isn't familiar with you guys will become familiar, is how did the foundation start? And is there an origin story? There's always 
something there. So I'll kind of let you take the reins from, from here. Yeah, so our origin story, you could say, is a bit of a sad origin, or, origin story. If I can talk, that'd be great. <laughs> um, so we were founded in 2012 after the passing of Tom Riley, who was a Fort Washington, Pennsylvania resident. Um, Tom left behind four children, and the foundation was created in his memory to assist other families, including his own, with uh, fundraising for 529 plan funds. So if you're not familiar with the 529 plan fund is, which is surprising a lot of people are not, um, it's actually an education savings plan fund. So what we do is we have a big walk, typically in June. Uh, we had to pivot a little bit for 2020 and 2021 because of COVID. Um, but typically in June, the weekend of Father's Day, we have a nice walk at the Fort Washington State Park, um, the Flower Town Pavilion. So that walk, all the proceeds actually are split between the children that are chosen and then get donated to their 529 plan fund. So the hope is that over the next X amount of years before they head off to college, that the, that fund um, amount from our fundraiser can grow and assist them with paying for college tuition. So we find that a lot of families sadly don't have those funds set aside, especially the ones we try to help out. And it's some um, it's can sometimes be a relief for the families to have just a little bit set aside for college tuition. Hmm. Yeah. We're we're actually pretty familiar because we're a CPA firm here for so 529s yeah. we deal with all, all the time. Yeah. But I think it's always nice when you see something tragic happen and you guys turn it into a positive. And education funding, I I know people have made jokes about this, but it's the moment you have the kid. You have to start planning for education funding because it is it's college has gotten that expensive. So exactly. It's nice, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've all we've all become accustomed to that, unfortunately. But yeah. what I think was actually interesting, and I think it you kind of answered why that was, and I was wondering is that it seems that a lot of the people that you guys have chosen, just looking through your website, um, some mm -hmm. prior year recipients were so young. And I was wondering why that was, but I think it's a really good idea that you contribute to these 529s and almost give them the time to grow rather than donating. To someone who's 17 years old about to go to college. I never really and, thought and of it that way. I wouldn't say that we specify by age range. We right. basically specify by need. So last year we did have a couple of older um, individuals as recipients, but we also have, it, it really just ranged the spectrum of ranges of ages. So it really goes off about the um, need, but also the nominations. We don't, so, Ironically enough, this is the first year that I've had a, a lot of nominations. Prior years, I only had maybe two or three. So um, this, year, uh, this year, sorry, um, is definitely different for me as an executive director because we had to go through a more regular, rigorous um, process to fit, pick out our family for 2022. Could you speak to kind of what that process looks like? Yeah, so... How it works is there's actually a nomination form on our website that a family member or a family friend can fill out. Mm -hmm. um, we typically like to say a family friend fills it out for them. And from there, I get that nomination myself. I'll review it, look over it. Um, if it seems like a valuable nomination, and typically they're in the United States, I have gotten random ones from different countries before, and sadly, we cannot assist them at this time. Mm -hmm. um, but typically we stay within the Philadelphia region. So most of our families have been from Newtown Square up into Huntington Valley area. Mm -hmm. So we're right around Philly and we have a couple families from Philly too. Um, so we stick around that area with the nominations, but really it's a community effort to get the nominations. Um, we have a lot of families that, now that we've had so many families come through, they actually you know, have found other families that need have the need as well. So they right. often nominate from within, um, but it's also nice to see that other people outside of our community are finding us too in nominating. So, and after the nomination is done, I will sit down have about a half hour conversation with the family. Um, and if I'm able to find out who nominates them, have a conversation with them too. Sometimes the nominators fill in the form um, with the family's information completely and not include their own information. So I can't mm -hmm. talk to them, mm -hmm. um, but, 
I have about a half hour conversation with the family, get to know them, figure out if they're a good fit for us. And then we'll take it to the board and we usually vote. Now this year is a little longer of a process since we had so many um, families nominated this year, which is a great thing um, for us as an organization to have the options and to kind of keep going, but also a very sad thing, you know, um, it's a tragedy that we have to keep being an organization to a point because that we would rather see these kids grow up with both parents or, or both parents, uh, all their parents, truthfully. Yeah. So. yeah. I was thinking about this while I was sitting here. I don't, we've interviewed a few foundations before, but we don't always get the reason why maybe a board member like yourself got involved mm-hmm. with Bravehearts. And I just wanted to know what, why specifically did you get involved? I'm sure there's some. So <laughs> it's a, it's a little, um, funny I guess you could say so I used to work at a company and the founder Joe Spaws uh, was with the company um, and he asked me if I'd like to help with marketing because they used to do their marketing Mm -hmm. and I was like yeah totally I like to volunteer my time I haven't had like an opportunity to really get involved in the community where I was living at that time and I thought it would be a great time and I still live in the community so um it just felt like a right fit at that point in time. And I was really focused with education. I had always wanted to teach and I actually ended up leaving that company and moved on to education. Um, I teach in the college profession and that's about how I joined. Uh, I moved into the executive director role in 2019. Our executive director at the time decided she wanted to uh, step back. So I was kind of the obvious choice um, because I was one of the few members that had the capabilities to kind of keep us keep us going you could say yeah so So a lot on the show I think what we want to do is explore a lot that has to go that goes into putting together and building a foundation Mm -hmm. on the back end where you can now see the success stories that that come out of it and what you guys are able to accomplish and I think later we're for sure going to get to some of those success stories uh, that you've seen go through but yeah I guess before we get there, I wanted to explore more about, so we talked about like how the organization came to be and maybe how you started in it, but what has been for you maybe a challenge of be, like being in the community and having to deal, because we were talking about this before, on how to make this subject a little bit less sad because you, the only reason you're getting these applications is because of bad things that have happened but how you go about kind of framing this when you're talking to the family as a very, very positive thing to come out of a negative situation. Yeah. So the, definitely the one big thing is we have that big walk and I've heard from a lot of families in the past that it's actually a moment of celebration of the life of the loved one. Um, Because if you think about it, this walk is oftentimes the first time that the family has gotten to see extended friends and family since possibly the the loss of their loved one. Um, Maybe it's finally they've gotten in the grief process enough to actually celebrate and remember the individual that had passed. And that's really something special that the families have said the walk really helps with. Mm -hmm. And with COVID, especially having been the last two years, it was really hard for some of our families to, to come together and celebrate and remember the individual and last year's families especially um we were able to host a walk in September in person and it it was something you know we had three families there in total one was our 2020 family because we wanted to give them an in-person experience because our 2020 walk was all virtual and Mm -hmm. then we had two families we supported last year the Phillips and the Noceros and they both um the Phillips family actually lost their father to COVID and then the Nocero um, family had happened like right before COVID had hit. So they really didn't have that moment to gather as a group and have a group gathering outside of maybe a funeral. And I think that's kind of the special element of having that celebration of life. Yeah, I think it's tough. Sense? Yeah, for sure. And I think it's tough to talk to too, because you hear a lot of stories from, especially the COVID time where people weren't able to have, like have funerals or attend these things because of the social distancing rules or lockdowns at some point. So it wasn't really even an option for some people. And I think you see a lot of like people trying to catch up on that now. Like, I think even, for example, Ian and I, we both didn't walk across the stage at graduation just because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people missed a lot of important and not even to equate the two. No, of course not. People (laughs) missed a lot of important events uh, over that time period. And what does a virtual walk look like? How'd you guys do that? 
Um, we tried to pivot as best as we could because <laughs> our walks are in June. So we yeah. literally had already started planning and getting registration ready when COVID hit. Um, so, and that was actually supposed to be my first walk in person that I was planning because the 2019, <laughs> I took of over course. right after, right after the 2019 walk happened. That was like our transition period. Like she kept me in the loop for everything. I was like, we transitioned at that point. So the best we could, we did with what we, we had, um, yeah. we didn't have the current website we have right now. So it, the whole donation system was completely different. It was a lot, it was kind of a pain, but the one thing that we ended up just doing was live streaming on Facebook. Um, yeah. So I ended up meeting up with our family um, at the Fort Washington State Park the day we were supposed to have the walk and we live streamed it. And it was, you can still go back on our Facebook page and watch it. There's a couple of very hilarious moments um, when you're walking a trail with a, a two, three-year-olds, actually were the girls three yet? They may have just been two. Um, and then their older brother you can, and their dog, it was, hilarious um so that was the main thing and then we did a couple other little live streams I had some raffle baskets and stuff that people could purchase and be part of if they wanted to get tickets so um that was all kind of together for for the virtual walk and we, we tried the best we could and actually truthfully we fundraised the same amount we did for an in-person walk which was really amazing and I was really happy as an executive director being able to say that to the family having yeah just went through a, a walk that wasn't normal for us. That's amazing. And I, not, I mean, I don't want to keep harping on COVID, but I guess one other thing I wanted to say that is you saw uh, the communities in every different state, but specifically for us, like in our community, you saw a lot of people band together during COVID to keep alive mm -hmm. some of these foundations or restaurants, like people would order out instead of making food at home one night because they wanted to support the local restaurant and not just because they yeah. wanted their food. And I thought that was actually a pretty amazing thing to see, like communities coming together. And it's good that we're continuing that following COVID, but. You actually just kind of said what our tagline is. Our tagline to be brave, band together. There you go. So that's our tagline. Even, we didn't even plan that, right? <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's but. good. So that was your first walk was, was getting to deal with uh, all the COVID situation and having to pivot. Yeah, and pivot the entire walk at that point. So it was definitely an experience, but I'm glad we got to have an in-person walk last year because it, it, it definitely prepared me for the normal in-person walk this year, I hope. So yeah. um, did the new website and everything come out of the basically the need for innovation for going more virtual? Uh, that and the website also hadn't been updated since the foundation. Um, yeah. And I, in my position that I have full time, uh, we had an intern actually come and help out with that, that I was teaching. So um, it was kind of a great thing that he got experience and we got a new site so yeah so how do the funds raised kind of go towards the family is it a funds raised in a calendar year will go towards the selected families or yeah so last year was a little different typically january 1 until the end of june like about two weeks after the walk um all the funds raised in that time period will get split as long, proceed wise will get split between the children um, last year we had to do it a little differently since we did the walk in September. So we, we have that buffer. Um, the reason we do that is because of course, as an organization, we do have some overhead costs. So with donations from July until December will help with the overhead costs. And we try to keep that very, very minimally. And if people want to know our donor reports are online. <laughs> so, <laughs> do you get a lot of people asking you for that? <laughs> actually, no, ironically not. I still have to, um, that's the one thing on my list this week is to get the 2021 donor report finished. Mm -hmm. um, but ironically, no, not a lot of people want to see that, which I think is just a testament to our organization and what we do. Absolutely. Yeah, so, I think I think people, when they can see someone like yourself as the executive director, they tend to have a lot more of that trust rather than when it's yeah. some yeah. big, uh, whatever, some big charity that you're donating to and you don't have the slightest idea who's in charge of running those things. Yeah. I think when you work with a small charity, I think that speaks to why it's really nice to work with a small charity. Like you said, everything stays in the community. Yeah, community members donating to people that are in their own community. I think that's great. Yep. Yeah, I think transparency is always super key when you're talking about any foundation. I didn't realize that, is that a requirement that you guys have that or is it just something you guys do? It's technically a requirement if you want to get cert. There's one certificate for donations that you have to do it with, um, but it's not technically a requirement that I know of. Um, it's just part of what we do just to be transparent. Yeah. So 
Yeah, I know good. a lot of larger organizations that probably have millions of dollars are forced to do it, but yeah, <laughs> we're very small. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's one of the cool things you can do also with your free time is kind of volunteer it and give it for a purpose that's bigger than yourself. So what if, I mean, it, this is just maybe a selfish question, but what do you get out of being a part of this organization? Um. That's actually a really hard question for me. I think it's the it's the whole idea of giving back. I I went to a Catholic college. It was very focused on community and giving back. And that in addition to my childhood, I was always focused on giving back to a certain point or being involved in something. So after college, it was a little rough, I guess you could say, for me to find somewhere I fit. Mm -hmm. and having the ability to give back at the same time while I'm also using my creative skills like my marketing skills that I like to do and my web development skills to do something for good is something that I think I, I really enjoy. Yeah absolutely and I think that the best way to show people obviously where their money is going when they donate is to talk about some of these success stories and I know we had mentioned we would get into it and I wanted to is there someone that's, or a family that sticks out directly to you or anything you can share about one of them that your foundation made this huge tangible difference in their life? There, There's definitely a lot of tangible differences. Um, if I'm just thinking to the Riley family, who was, of course, our original family, their oldest is a freshman in college now. Um, and the funds we raised for them definitely have helped support their college, their college goals or their education goals. So that's really... Um, it's kind of like a full circle moment for me because that is the first family that has hit the college level for us, truthfully. Like our first, like our original family is now in college. That's kind mm -hmm. of like a, I guess you could say mind blowing thing for me, even though I wasn't involved when they were our original family. Right. So, so year over year, do they do families tend to stay involved, stay around the foundation, yeah. do you stay in communication? How does that all work? Yeah, so part of our structure is actually we ask that each family give back in some way that at least for one or two years after they've been nominated, mm -hmm. just to keep them involved. But truthfully, all of our families come to the walk. Everyone that's been nominated prior has come to the walk that I like. And then if they can't, they email one of us and is like, I'm so sorry, our kid is sick. Like, we don't want to infect anybody or, yeah. you know, we scheduled something or there's a football game, like not football, but like a soccer game or something that day mm -hmm. so they're all really involved and we have families that continue to fundraise for us they're they're I, I still remember um one of the younger kids ha does a bake sale or used to do a bake sale every year and he'd raise like 400 dollars, which I think is just incredible that he took the ambition to do that for the organization so you must make some good brownies <laughs> I, I know I never got the opportunity to go see it but I I bet he did. <laughs> yeah, uh, especially during uh, the Girl Scout cookie season. They really have that corner, that market cornered. <laughs> uh, outside of the walk, what other kind of uh, fundraising activities do you guys usually uh, engage in? So we've tried a couple of different things throughout the years. Um, we have actually had really good success with our Christmas card sale. So what I do or what the families and I do, um, I actually ask for a couple of pictures that the kids have drawn. So I get the cute kid artwork slash more adultish artwork from the older kids and I get postcards printed out. So, and then we, we do a little fundraiser with that. Um, that actually is very successful for us. And um, a lot of people actually use them as their Christmas cards. To, and it also spreads the word about Bravehearts. Um, we've done a couple other little fundraisers here and there during the preparation for the walk, our family, the Hensleys, um, actually host a fundraiser at Jersey's in Glenside. So that is yet to be scheduled for 2022 yet. I have to talk to them still. If they're listening, I will be emailing them. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's one of the kind of mainstays things we have done. We've had, we usually do a lot of dine and donate, donate um, fundraisers. Mm -hmm. And I've tried a couple other things. We did a cookbook one year, which actually was very successful too. Um, and then a couple other like small gathering fundraisers. So cool. Yeah, but the main thing is the walk. Yeah, I feel like that's not something you always think about, uh, especially with a foundation like this, is getting creative in terms of how to move donations because everything that you're doing is supposed to go into that family. So you have to come up with new creative ways to be innovative with 
donations. I've never even thought about that before. It's like, yeah. it's an interesting uh, way to go about it. So you said that you found what, which one to be most successful, the Christmas cards? Yeah, the Christmas, it's, it's like a holiday card sale. Yeah. It, it, for some reason, everyone just loves to get a picture that one of the kids drew that year and get a couple, like last year I had four or five options and we have a bunch of families that like purchase them and we mm -hmm. sell, I think we do um, 20 cards for $20 or something like that. I, had yeah. to, I don't remember. I blanked that out. Last, <laughs> the end of last year was a little rough with the walk and, and everything. So yeah. not rough, but a lot. One thing I wanted to circle back to is you said that your original family who the, the one the foundation kind of came out of is just yeah. just hit his fresh for his or her freshman year of school and have you but you did say that you had other people who come through the foundation who were maybe a little bit older so yeah. have people already gone through the college process with the funds from brave hearts or so there i believe there was one specifically that has finished the college process um mm -hmm. our our two children from last year I can't really call them children they're basically grown men at this point um Aiden and Andrew um they're both at the process of picking out college right now so um and I believe Andrew actually started his freshman year and I might be confusing the boys but so one of them is in college right now so I think it's cool that you guys stay in constant communication with the people that you're helping out um, have you found that your community has just kind of continued to grow and that you have more and more people coming back to that walk every year? Can you speak yeah. to the growth of that maybe? Yeah, that's definitely part of it. Um, a lot of our community members have been with us since the beginning of the walk. Like our setup and registration crew have like really been with us since the beginning, which is awesome because they know how everything works and we don't have to re-explain it 50,000 times to, to everybody. Um, but definitely the community there there's an element of everyone coming back like I said the families all kind of come back and then they bring their grandparents or they bring their parents and you know there's always some sort of element of everyone kind of coming back together and it, that's the nice thing and even just um sponsors too we we have some sponsors that have been with us since the beginning which is really amazing yeah and I think absent of the money and everything that you guys donations raise it's probably a lot of what has to do with your organization I could be speaking incorrectly but probably has to do with the community that you guys of support and things that you guys have built and now that going to that walk or interfacing with any of your board members is probably a safe space for those people and those families to talk to someone who cares because the reason you're volunteering your time is because you care about these families yeah. and things that they've had to endure so have you experienced that too of you said that you met with some families and you have to do the face-to-face -face interviews when they get nominated so have you found that that is kind of how people also view the the organization and not just as a place to receive funds yeah I think there's definitely a, a whole community aspect to it that like we don't talk about a whole lot but we have a lot of at this point, I think we're up to 11 official families. We have two new ones that I'm going to talk about hopefully in a little bit. Um, but I've already had our 2020 family asking to talk to some of the, have wanting to talk to the 2022 families. Like they, yeah. there's this community that they create within themselves. And a lot of the original, like the, I want to say they're like the originals, but they're really yeah. like the first five years. Um, all of the moms were very, very close. They used to go out for dinner a lot and then everybody started to get older and you know, stuff happened in sporting games and everything. So I don't know how much they still do that, but there's that underlying community element of just the parents themselves connecting and um, starting to, to go through the healing process together, I think, to a yeah. point. And I think that's almost the unspoken bond that people can have when they've all gone through a relative tragedy that someone who hasn't can't always fully grasp and why don't we get to that now? The families, the 2021 families, right? Did you want to 2022. share? 2022. 2022 families. Where am yeah. I? I'm, I'm still living in, in last year. It's but, okay. <laughs> I feel like this last few years have really gone by. But do you want to talk a little bit about them and see yeah. what? Yeah, definitely. So we have our 2022 walk will be on June 18th. I wanted to say 11th. June 18th, the 
Saturday before Father's Day. And we have just finalized our two families um, for this walk. It will be the Waja family with Gabby and Liam. And then there's also the Dozman family with Dennis. So we typically have, we usually try to have at least three ch children that we, we support per walk. It, it fluctuates, um, but we found that both those families out of all of the families that were nominated and everyone that was nominated was so worthy of, of being part of the walk. And truthfully, a few of them will be continuing into possibly 2023 candidates. Um, they just stood out to us as an organization as the kind of, there's this overarching element of the heart and the soul of what, what we do. And they exhibit it um, just the way they approached the conversations we had. Hope that was pretty, it, it's pretty straightforward once we get through the nomination process. So, but I'm look, really looking forward to talking to the, uh, not talking, but working with the Dozmans and also the Wajas because they're definitely um, looking forward to being part of our community. And I, and I think our community is gonna welcome them with open arms, hopefully, so. Yeah, this is a weird question, but how long is the walk? So the walk itself is a little under a mile. Okay. Um, we go up one of the trails in the Fort Washington State Park. Um, we go from basically the Flower Town Pavilion, which is off of Mill Road, up until the Valley Green Road, mm -hmm. like crossing, and then we turn around and come back. Okay. So, but the walk itself, we start at registration opens at 10. No, registration opens at nine. Sorry, the walk starts around 10 o'clock. And then we're usually wrapped up about around noon, one o'clock. So it's usually about a four to five hour period. And um, it's a great experience for anyone that just wants to be out in the community and helping others. Yeah, so in order to support you guys, is that one of the main things to do? Would you to go to the walk or to, can you take us through the donation process so people that yeah. are maybe can hear you guys' message for the first time would be able to become a part of this? Definitely. So our walk is the main like donation avenue, I guess you could say, but mm -hmm. everything is possible through our online to donation system. So our website is, there's two URLs. We have a shortened one and we also have a longer one. So if you want to do the longer one, it's bravehearts4strongminds.org or bh4, the number four, sm.org. So I tried to shorten it out. It, it was getting a little hard to keep typing that out every time <laughs> for some people. So um, <laughs> yeah. So it's very simple process. There's a donation button on the website. You can read more about the families. And from there, it, you can sign up to be a one-time donor, monthly donor, yearly donor, whatever you want to choose. And that essentially is where most of our donations come through. Um, donations can also come through check. Um, we don't, I wouldn't say send money in the mail because that's not a great idea, but check, um, but also online donations avenues are pretty much how we how we operate yeah so when it comes to registering for the walk is there a form online or something like that yes yeah, so there's a registration form online um that should be open now but how that works is basically you choose uh not choose but you select how many walkers you're going to have um adults are 25 children are 10 and yeah <laughs> sorry i always get those numbers confused a little bit and then um from there, you select if you want a t-shirt, your t-shirt size, your address, your phone number, all that fun stuff. And then just it goes through the online payment process, which actually goes through PayPal. Um, we found that was the easiest avenue for a lot of our users. So everyone's pretty familiar with PayPal. So Yeah. So if you're in the area and you want to be a part of a, a walk, it's good. It's not too long of a walk. It won't preclude it. Everybody can yeah. do a mile. Yeah. Right. And Everybody you can go can slow or you can be like um, some of the kids that just decide to run the whole thing and are back in like 20 minutes. Yeah, they treat it like a race. <laughs> they, yes, they, they treat it like, <laughs> I, I need to pick out for this year, maybe some prizes for those kids that decide to run the whole entire time and get back in 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I'm so always you wait like, at the finish line and you see all 10 of the kids coming? Yeah. <laughs> So I, I usually don't get a chance to go and do the physical walk. So I will stay back. We'll, we'll start the walk out and then I'll stay back and 
pick up and do a couple of things um, logistics wise. We do have a band, so I make sure the band's fine and we have some activities for the kids. Is it a local so, band? Um, usually, so last year we had our first time and it was really, we, we, we are hoping they will be back again this year. Um, Oakland, they are from the Philly area. Um, we've had other bands in the past that have been really great as well, but they, they came last year and we really enjoyed them. So we're hoping they'll come back this year. We're talking to them. There you go. Maybe, maybe they'll see this. Um, maybe. We, yeah, they want you back guys. Listen <laughs> up. But, um, was there, was there any other success stories or anything that you wanted to share for, um, the organization just so people can have a, maybe another good story to take away out of a sadder topic that try, I was talking to you, I was, we set to turn it around the most positive we can, um, yeah. Um, I mean, truthfully, every family we've worked is worked with is a success story to a point. You know, we've raised I can't I'm not good with numbers at this time right now. <laughs> um, but I know we've raised over half a million uh that's for fantastic. all of our families. Wow, and I think awesome. we might be closer to three quarters of a million. But um, you know, just being able to help the kids and the children in some way with some sort of funds that can grow within their 529 plans or even just pay for the first semester of college you know that's a big chunk you know college isn't cheap anymore no 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 no. um um, no that's that's amazing but is there anything else you wanted to share with us or anything else you guys wanted to plug so we make sure we get it out to our audience I think like I kind of covered everything, but if anyone has any questions, they can, um, there's a contact form on the website. They can get in contact with me. The sponsorship stuff's up there if anyone wants to be a sponsor um, and just the registration process is there too. So yeah, awesome. Ian, is there anything from your end? No, what was the Facebook? I know you said you had a lot up on that Facebook. What's, is it just Brave Hearts Um, or Strong Minds? It's facebook.com backslash BH4SM Philly, I think. Okay. The, the link's on the website, too. We'll get that link. We'll put everything below. So anyone yeah. who's looking or now listening or watching yeah. this as it came out, uh, you can go check below and you'll have everything yeah. that you need. We're going to make you memorize all your URLs. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I keep asking for URL addresses. <laughs> you didn't know. But that the, the short code for the website is bh4sm.org. So that's okay. the shortest I could get it without having legal issues. Yeah. You didn't know you were going to get a quiz when you hopped on here. Today. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. But um, I think that's it for me. Yeah, but I right. really appreciate you giving us your time and talking and volunteering your time to a foundation such as Thank Brave Hearts for Strong Minds. And uh, we hope that anyone who's listening to this, maybe we can get some donations or people to show up at the at the walk. And uh, it's amazing to hear all you guys have already uh, received. I didn't think it would be that high or it didn't. I guess I had no idea. Well, <laughs> I guess I should have said this is our 10th year. <laughs> Yeah, there you I go. didn't say that at all. It's our 10th anniversary this year. So, oh, perfect. Um, yeah, so I completely blanked on saying that. So this hey, is our 10th annual walk. Got to make it the biggest year yet then. Yeah, that's the hope. <laughs> there you guys go. Well, now's the perfect time to donate if you're out there. But we appreciate you so much and uh, everything. So thanks for getting on this. And we wish you a, wish you a healthy walk. And hopefully yeah, the thanks, end of COVID. <laughs> yeah, Thank hopefully. you. Have a great Hey, or rest of your day. Hey, thank you. All right, guys, welcome back again. And we hope you stuck around after following the interview with Andrea. We really enjoyed that one. And we hope you guys did too. And if you want to donate, might as well because it's going to go to a good cause. Yeah. And maybe come out to the walk. Yeah. I'm thinking about going to the walk. I know. That sounds fun. I think that's something we should do. It'd be cool. And everyone, so if you want to hear about, if you stuck around strictly about the bison burgers, I, I don't know if you did, but we're going to get into it right now. Yeah, I want to to hear about your bison experience. So I kind of put you on. You did. Kind of put you on. Hillside Farms, shopsb.co, great little local working farm. So wait, start me from the beginning. What did you think of the shopping experience? I mentioned on a previous podcast, it's a very interesting kind of... I was... It's it's interesting, right? It's not not like a normal store. Let me just take you through the first moment of pull... I'm still in my car. So I'm pulling up and I got greeted by just an aggressive squawk from a turkey... Oh, the oh, it was aggressive, and I was thinking. You, did you come in and like park like right on the right hand side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And I was, and I, and I got out thinking I can see why why we use these for Thanksgiving. These things are annoying. Mm. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, yeah, the the turkeys were pretty. There was a there was a good amount of them. I, I wonder if they sell them when it comes Thanksgiving time. Yeah, I don't know. 
I well, didn't know they had turkeys. Oh, really? No, I didn't know that. Nice. Oh. So I walked into the shop and I started to like almost walk upstairs because I was like, it can't. Yes, that's quite, confusing. I was like, it can't quite possibly be right here. Right here. Yeah. Because yeah. it was just so small. And then I went up to what I would say the sales associate who didn't want to <laughs> sell sa- me bison. <laughs> the sales representative. I, <laughs> I think I'll note here too is there's no signage. There's not yeah. something like bison here, or like there's like one p- like word document like masking taped to like the surface of like the fridge or something with like their prices on. The it. fridge it. is also not see through and it's locked. Yeah. So oh, is it was it locked? Yeah, so oh, it wasn't locked. When I, I was. He must have taken it off. How am I supposed to even begin the shopping experience? Yeah. Without it, like I can't even see if there's anything in there. Right. So. I don't know, I went about doing my thing and he just, or I actually was just looking around until he s- finally stared at me and he surmised, I guess, that I was there to buy. Was he in there when you when you first got there or yes. he, was he like out doing something? No, he something? was in there. He was in there? Yeah. Oh, okay. So he just, I think he just kind of thought I was supposed to know what to do, but I, I didn't know what to do. Yeah, it is a weird assumption that they make. Because I, I was like, I remember I was there and I was buying, when I was buying something and I was like, I don't. I've never been here before, so I don't know what I'm doing. And he's like, oh, well, you it have It really to... seemed like he didn't want to sell me the bison. He said three words the whole time I was there, and they were all regarding the payment. Yeah, he's very soft-spoken. That's for sure. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, there's just some people who, like, that's not really their forte. I think this dude spends a lot of time out farming and whatnot. I don't know. That's, like, because when I came in, he was like... He had, like, overalls on, was, like, dirty. Like, you can tell he, he's been doing something all day. I was thinking about that, but, I mean, by the end of my transactions, like, it was around, like, we probably almost spent, like, $200 there. Mm-hmm. So, he, making some good money off that, off a random person just popping in, you know? Yeah, right. So, I bought burgers, ribeyes, and a roast. Yep. And snagged you the the New York strips. And the roast is like the size of a piece of firewood. Like yeah, it's big. It's big. Yeah, I'm really excited. I haven't cooked the roast yet, but I did do the burgers. Mm-hmm. And the bison burgers, they're very very good. What I what I was telling you before the podcast is they're a lot leaner than normal burgers. You ever had turkey burgers? I I don't like them. I've had them. I don't. Kind of reminded me of like a turkey burger when I had it. I, I don't know. I, I found turkey burgers to always be very dry. I felt the bison to be pretty Not so. juicy. Okay. So you have to cook them a little bit less than normal burgers because they're leaner. So mm-hmm. they don't have as much fat, so it don't take as long to cook. So what I did is I told you I put the, the paprika, some onion powder, some garlic. Um, what else did I put? Garlic on? or pepper. garlic powder? Garlic powder. Okay. And then I did, and then I did a little rub of Dijon mustard on each side. It's an interesting touch. I know. There, I, I looked up a, a recipe, and it was like this is pro- this what the Dijon does is it gives you more like juiciness into the burger. Interesting. So, and I've never had, I've never cooked something with mustard on it. Do you like mustard? I like certain types of mustard. Okay. I don't like all mustard, but certain types okay and so i then i put it on the the grill i cooked it up and i was really worried about overcooking it because i was reading all about it and saying that since it's leaner it will cook and dry out a lot faster right so i cooked it on low heat so it took probably 20 minutes to cook when it would have taken like seven so it took a while to cook but i think that's probably the way to do it if you don't want to dry it out because I was really worried about hmm. it. I put it on the top shelf of the... Of the oh. group. Well, I cooked it on the bottom. I moved right. it to the top. Left it there for a little while. And it was fantastic. And I was telling you about it is... I felt better after eating it. I don't know if it's psychosomatic. But all I know right. is that I've eaten two burgers before and felt very full and very, like, stuffed to the brim. Yeah. Like, uncomfortable. And I, there was a tangible difference where you, I, I just felt... I felt better. I didn't feel as full. Right. And I ate two burgers, and I like I was telling you, I don't remember the last time I've eaten two like. Full and they're size pretty healthy burgers. size. Like, yeah, they're pretty. What I also noticed was different was when I cooked the ones that I bought before. I didn't, for the record, I didn't like them as much as you did. I loved them, and you did a lot more of it than I did. And I think if I was going to do it again, I would probably venture into some type of seasoning or whatever. Um, but I just wanted to like, I don't know, 
let it speak for itself. I wanted to try it like as is yeah. and just see what it was. And to me, it just didn't taste like much. Mm-hmm. And like I, I think I had two as well. And it just it didn't do a lot for me. Um, did I'm, you did you feel the way I'm talking about, or did you just not really notice a difference? I'm trying to think if I did. I don't know. I now that now I'm like looking back, I'm not sure. It's like hard to remember because I asked my family if they felt that same way, and I don't know if they were just stroking my ego, but they did say that. They said that they they tasted very good, and they mm-hmm. also didn't feel like. Because there's a lot of grease that goes along with, like, traditional burgers. Yes. And there's not... Depending on which one you buy, for sure. And there's not much grease at all, at least from what I was seeing. Well, that's what I was going to say. What's interesting is, you're, you, like, if you ever, you ever bought, like, Baba Burgers or, like, yeah. cheap, like, yeah. frozen ones at the store, um, they'll, like, start this size. And by the time you're done, like, they shrink yes. way down. Those Vice Burgers don't really shrink it's hardly at all. Like it's it's maybe yeah. a little bit they come down in size, but not much at all. Yeah, and you can tell they don't really use preservatives. It's very fresh. It's vacuum sealed bags. Like yeah. it's not like a Bubba Burger where it's just in a cardboard right. casing. Yeah, definitely it's not. Like gonna, it's never gonna go bad. But yeah, I, I mean, I'm really excited for the ribeyes, and it's probably my favorite like cut. Uh, and the roast, I just, we're thinking crock pot all the way. That's what I think I'm doing too. So we'll report back about how we're doing with this bison. But I honestly think, it's just like, and, and I saw you put this on there, update on my my 2022 goal. I yes. actually feel like this is the first step. It's although close. although it's not technically wild game, because right. they're obviously raised on a bison farm. It's it's the next step of like taking taking the step to go find something that's not in a traditional grocery store. Mm-hmm. Like we had to go have a conversation with a mute to get this mute, meat. So it's like, <laughs> a mute. he really doesn't talk, but to go and hey, get, man. he's a great guy though. I don't want to say a thing. He's, no, a, yeah, he's I, a wonderful guy. And I think he's just a man of few words. Like, yeah. I don't think he, he's a simple guy. He yeah. doesn't have much to say. He's not, he's not someone who's going to chat your ear off. That's he's probably sure. not coming if, on the podcast. Yeah, if you're someone who likes to get in, get out, buy what you want and leave, not have a lot of conversation, that is your man. Yeah. So I feel like this is the first step to that. And for people who maybe missed that episode, um, my 2022 goal is to take something from A to Z in terms of food and prepare myself, extract it from its environment, everything. Alive to, to table. Yes. And that's my goal. So I feel like this is a first step. We're pretty early in 2022. I got a lot of time, but I wanted to to take the first step to kind of. I went. I picked it up. It's obviously very fresh meat. Mm-hmm. I prepared it all myself. Took it. I mean, cooking. I do that all the time, but uh, I do feel like, the, and I was happy about it. So it was like an event almost. I went out to the grill. I prepped it. Prepped the meat. And I was pretty excited about it. Yeah, I, um, I have an interesting tidbit to this. Also, I got another bone to pick with you specifically because remember on the podcast when we went through the differences between bison and buffalo? Right. So this farm is called Hillside Bison. Right. The packaging said buffalo burgers. <laughs> so they're different animals. But what I'm confused about is... Does, do they just assume that people don't really think that there's a difference? So buffalo is something that people kind of recognize better than the word bison. Didn't we but say... technically it's a bison farm. Didn't we say bison buffalo is a geographical distinction? Yeah. Not like a hereditary one? Like a genetic distinction? Mm. I can't remember now. I feel like you're right. Because there's like there's because animals it, like that that because are if, considered different, but it's just geographical. In your case, if you're saying that, then what they're saying is, is completely... So accurate. this is identifying bison as what we're talking about. Buffalo is like water buffalo in Africa. I don't know if we're ever... Cause I, don't, I don't know... Yeah, they're, they're different animals. Completely different animals, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Bison have large humps and their shoulders and bigger heads than buffalo. They also have beards. So technically what I think... What we ate was a... Bison. Yeah, so what I think is going on here is it's actually a bison farm. It's bison meat, mm-hmm. but they call it buffalo because people just don't know what bison is in our area. Like, you would recognize right. the word buffalo way before bison. And I feel like you associate buffalo like buffalo with buffalo food. Buffalo wild wings. Or right, fish. I think like you like buffalo chicken. Like, I think that like people more regularly associate, associate buffalo with food. And I think if you said buffalo around here, someone would be like, that, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. I don't think they would think 
like water buffalo. Like, I don't think they would immediately be like, I think you're talking about the animal <laughs> on the plains in Africa. <laughs> That's a good point. But an interesting tidbit about this, you yeah. just said that bison is not a game animal. So there's currently this weird situation where in certain states, bison are identified as wildlife, and in other states, they are identified as like farm animals. Can we accidentally put ourselves in the middle of a debate? <laughs> this is actually a hot, hot, hot topic of a debate right now. So basically what's happening is like due to the two different distinctions, and there's like no other animal that's like this, where in one state it's considered game, where in another state it's considered farm. Okay. And so when these game animals cross over a border, because they don't know the difference, into a state where they're now farm animals, they're now like a nuisance animal and you can just shoot them. Okay. So, what's happening is, like, I think it's in California, they're described as game animals. So, they're in, like, the, um, what's that big ecosystem? Oh, I just forgot the name of it. I'll think of it in a second. But they'll cross over into, like, Colorado yeah. or Nevada, like, different states west. And then when they do so, they're now crossing over into a place where they're considered farm animals and they're nuisance animals. Mm -hmm. And so, basically, the argument that people are having now is how can it have two different distinctions, basically, by state? And so what people want to do is that, well, A, there's like this, this is going to get into a big conversation here. So <laughs> there's there's generally a thing with animals where animals have been extirpated from certain areas, so like, which is like a term for like regionally extinct. So like okay. bison used to populate states like as far west as like probably like Ohio. I don't know, probably even Pennsylvania. Um and so as far like, west? As far east, okay. sorry. As far east as like Pennsylvania. And so, is not my strong suit. So no, you were it. right. <laughs> and so they, they're, they, they're considered extirpated from those areas because they're not there anymore. But they're not extinct completely because they're somewhere far west. Yes. So they're considered, they can, they're considered extirpated. So the goal of a lot of wildlife organizations is to be like, they used to live here. So like we want them to live there again. But when you have laws like this, where as they cross into more eastern states, kind of working their way back oh. to native ranges, and they can just be immediately killed, it basically halts their progress towards any state east of the state where they're considered farm animals. How do you know so much about this? I was listening to a whole podcast about it. This but is pretty interesting. Isn't it crazy? Yeah. And so, like, basically the argument is that, like, the laws of one state now affect every state subsequently east of said yes. state. And so now it's like this big debate on like, is it just that state's decision? Or does it have to involve more people? And really it's gonna be you gotta like one state's decision. You gotta like artificially make the the migration path in the states that support keeping Buffalo alive. Right. To get them back across the country. Right. And so like that now it's become this big thing. And because I, I'm sure that there is like there's arguments for both, right? Like there's obviously the game protections of like the Bureau of Wildlife Management gets to kind of oversee bison and then regulate their numbers, grow mm -hmm. their population. But I'm sure that there's giant bison farms, probably similar to the ones that we're going to, probably a little bit bigger, that they get certain protections, certain laws, certain things because the bison are considered farm animals. Mm -hmm. And so they don't want it to now be considered a game animal because then they're going to have a harder time running their farms running their businesses so it's like somebody's gonna lose isn't that crazy i didn't realize it was that big of a debate it makes sense it's cool you explained it to be honest with you because so like are you saying that if if everything laws were the same federally and they were not game animals these farms that we're buying from would be okay because they wouldn't compete with people going to shoot their own is that what you're saying um say that one more time if they were farm animals yeah. Because, well, they wouldn't have game protections. So you couldn't regulate them. You couldn't give out tags. You couldn't, like, observe. You wouldn't have the funding to oversee the population numbers. I mean, you would probably grow a larger population of them, but they would be in, like, high fence situations where, like, like basically like cattle, yeah. where they're going to be just run on land and stuff like that. But it's, it's not going to be the same as, like, free-ranging animals the way it is now, where it's, like, like regular herds and things like that. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I can't believe we've accidentally entered 
love for bison this month. Well, it just goes to show that, like, there's so many, like, crazy, hotly debated topics in this country, and you've never even heard of them. Yeah. You know? And, like, that's, like, a crazy so, debate. all right, take your stance. Which side do you want? Um... See, here's the thing. I'm, I'm always, I'm. I would say I usually stand on the side of like I think it's better to go Bureau of Wildlife Management, allow it to be run by every state's fish and game agency. But I think it should be universally considered a game animal because it is. Just because you put a fence around it doesn't. It, it's not like a domesticated animal the same way I think a cattle is. Like yeah. cattle have been domesticated for how many hundreds of years? I don't think because you took something that was wild and put it in a fence for the last 50 years, it's now considered a, a farm animal. Yeah. You know, like, I don't think it's the same thing as, like, if I went up to somebody and I was like, which one of these doesn't belong? Chicken, goat, cow, bison. Yeah. They'd be like, a bison doesn't belong in that. That's solid. Well, actually, maybe they would. Maybe they'd say three of them produce milk, one doesn't, and that's the chicken, so that doesn't belong. But there's different <laughs> ways to cut that. There's, different, how many, there's a bunch of different ways to, like, what is it? There's, like... Hundred different ways to cut a cake skin or something. Skinny cat or something. Yeah, skinny cat. I don't like that. Yeah, I don't saying. like that either. Why would someone come? Up with that? <laughs> I don't know. But that is the saying. I know, but like, I don't know why that is that's the saying. Really weird. But I think I'm with you. I think as long as the bison does. a serial killer making up that <laughs> saying and everybody ran with it. I think as long as the bison don't like disrupt the local ecosystems, I think it's definitely worth it. Just right. let them run run free. Yeah. There's there's a lot of things that this podcast gets into, and I, I mean I. Could oh, talk I thought you were talking about our podcast, and I was like, yeah, we just support well, that too. We just supported a not for profit, and now we're talking about bison yeah. rights. Well, there's just some people who like dedicate their lives to like one specific type of issue, and yeah, like I, to this to them like this is this you, is like that's huge. actually a really big thing, and I don't know if you ever watched this TED talk, but it's called the power of single mindedness, mm-hmm. being obsessed with one topic, the amount that you can kind of get into and get deep in you yeah. know stru- like structural change you can make if you're singularly focused on one goal i've always thought about that because that's not really something that i'm interested in it's a ten thousand hour rule right yeah but it's just not something i'm interested in i like to do i like variety and i like to do different things and i like i kind of like to have multiple things going at one time rather than just be so obsessed with one thing yeah and i know that like and the whole idea of single-mindedness makes a lot of sense because you'll see people who do it become very successful. But then you see people like Elon who is doing like 17 different things every day. So I don't think there's one right way to do it, but I do think that if you are singularly focused on one thing, odds are you can probably get a lot accomplished because it's all you're going to think and care about. And yeah. it's going to stretch 24 hours a day, not just when you're I want to get the specific states that are involved in this. But if you haven't watched that TED Talk, I think it's worth it. It's only like 20 minutes long, and I think it's, uh, that whole TED Talk, like, agency is pretty smart. I feel like I've definitely learned a lot from it. There's so many TED Talks out there, it's unbelievable. It is. And I feel like it's almost, you know how, like, becoming a published author is kind of like a rite of passage for some people? I do think that, or, like, gives you credibility. I do think that's the way also what TED has kind of like walked into. If you have a TED talk, you're going to consider an expert, I think, than someone who doesn't. It's just like a differentiating factor. Oh, for sure. Yeah. There's actually a guy who, <laughs> another podcast I was listening to, I listen to a lot of podcasts apparently, um, there's a guy on TED Talk who I had watched before. Because I feel like TED Talk, I had a phase with TED Talk, so I would just be like, let's hear what this guy has to say about <laughs> some random topic. Let's toss it on. Um, and he was talking about, basically we have a huge waste problem in our country, and then he wanted to use like worms in order to like help kind of fix some of the food waste problem we have, and then like we obviously have like a huge soil problem in our country, so we've got a lot of problems. And we listen um, to the Sad Guru podcast? No, what was this guy's name? I can't remember his name, but... I just found out recently that he, like, developed this whole passion, like, got this whole, like, uh, basically, like, de- like developed, like, this whole, like, niche knowledge, and then, like, this whole plan, and then he was on TED Talk, and then he became, like, this expert, and that all came out of that because he was in prison because he murdered somebody. Nice. And I didn't know that. Like, they didn't, it wasn't like TED Talk was like, hey, heads up, you're watching a psycho murderer right now. They never, you never knew. You were just watch, and then I now listen to something else recently where they were like, "Yeah, this guy was on the TED talk, and he killed his, like his. I think he killed his wife or something." It's like, what the heck? Do you understand? How- it feels like you should lead with that. 
Like, how do you bury that? I don't understand how many people... Like, there's... I was thinking about this the other day. There's so many old documentaries, or even recent documentaries, of, like, old serial killers, and I don't think we're ever going to get another another one like that again. There's so much... Every single time in every one of these documentaries, it's always, oh, DNA wasn't invented yet, or the guy was wasn't caught on camera because there was no cameras. Nowadays, it's like, I feel like everything you do is tracked. How are we, there's never, or maybe there is, but do you know what I'm saying? It might not be another serial killer. M- Wait, what? Did you miss that whole thing? Yeah, I was, I now I figured out what I was trying to say. All right, well, let's, maybe let's not share more about my serial killer uh, interests and you share this because it's a m- way more uplifting thing than what I'm talking about. So I kind of got it wrong. <laughs> it's, Certain different ecosystems have certain different labels. So, guys, we're back on the bison. Yeah, so Yellowstone National Ecosystem, not park, has them labeled as wildlife, so you can't kill them there. But then if they cross into certain types of like land, so there's like, I think there's like, there's different classifications for land. So, if it crosses into like certain game lands or certain areas, then it can be just, then it receives the distinction of livestock. And then there's certain states it can cross into. So, like, as it, like, travels all through different land, it, like, flips back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then when it becomes livestock, basically, you can just, you can kill it. There's not, like, a a system for, like, right now, for example, for, like, elk. For large, use this word, ungulates, you like that one. Um, I have no idea what that word is. It's, like, means. deer, elk, oh, okay. moose. Um, nice. You have to get tags. Like, it's, it's managed through a system of, like, biologists will say there's this much, we want to kill this many to maintain a healthy population, whatever. So they have that system for bison in certain areas, but then in other areas it's considered just nuisance animal. You can shoot it on site. Mm-hmm. So it just limits the ability to grow a healthier, larger population that expands. So I don't know. I think, I think it'd be cool to t- – I, I think, like, these large um, – Another word, megafauna. <laughs> I'm dropping the words what today. What are you doing? Um, they, I think it'd be cool to see them expand to like native ranges. But at the same time, I don't know if everyone would like bison just rolling around. I do foresee this being a problem for me when you were saying that and my goals of taking something from A to Z. I think I might have to start with the fish because I don't know how I'm going to feel. I'm just thinking about a bison. I don't want to shoot it. Bison would be a weird thing to start with. <laughs> I can see, I can see like a rabbit, yeah, maybe. Most people's or first like thing a is squirrel, in a like something real small. Yeah, that's a good point. Not like you don't gotta manage a lot. Yeah. Would you eat a squirrel? I don't know. I'm, I'm back and forth. The only with reason squirrels. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure about squirrels because I've heard of a lot of people eating squirrel and then it being like disease and then like all that stuff. Yeah, just it's because they catch diseases easier than like a lot of animals. Squirrels do. Well, they're just all in everyone's business. It's true. I think they're eroded, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't want to eat. It's like eating a rat. Yeah, it's just it's a it's a rat with a big tail. Yeah, it's a squirrel or rodent. They are squirrels or rodents. The They're way you know. better looking than a rat, though. The more you know. Let's do let's do one more thing here before we close up the episode. Uh, we can talk about you want to talk about gas prices. So um, they're high. They're very high. It cost me. Seventy dollars to fill my tank the other day. Yeah, it's not cheap. The thing that I'm, I saw this thing on TikTok, and for all you people out there who are watching TikTok, please don't get all your news from there. But they said <laughs> this, this one group of people were saying we don't. Who cares about gas prices? We don't. We don't drive. And I was like, I just don't think people fully understand the whole scope of what raising gas prices means. It doesn't mean just when you drive. It means that every single thing that has fuel. And delivers your products or food or anything. Everything, yeah. That increases the price. I think people are sometimes so singularly minded on their own day-to-day life and activities that they don't realize that when they... Now, because gas prices grow up, when you go to the grocery store, that bread is more expensive because it took more money to get there. Right. It still affects you. Right. So stop... Indirect costs. (laughs) Yes. Please understand that every cost is not directly borne by you. It might be a hidden cost, but it's still there. And this still affects you. (laughs) So I just have to shake my head and bring it to the people who are going to listen. Critical thinking. That are going to listen to our podcast to let you know that 
things still affect you even if you don't drive and you have a... a we can take it one step further. Everyone thinks of gas as like the only thing gas is, is what goes in your car. Yeah. They don't think of it as like jet fuel also. Exactly. It's also natural gas, which heats your home and creates your electricity. Like, do you use power? <laughs> Do you, burn, do you burn a fire in the middle of your house? How, how are you heating your home? Oh, you're heating your home with probably natural gas, unless TikTok you have is, electric, is which great. you're burning natural TikTok gas. TikTok is great for organic reach and like really discovering new audiences, but I have to tell you, they put out, like it's some of the most pervasive and just one of the dumbest apps <laughs> out there. Like I'm being so dead serious. The amount of stuff that people put on there is... It just there's there's the lack of logic, and then I will hear people recite their news from TikTok. And I, don't yeah, get me wrong, there's some people that can put good information on TikTok, and you can learn. But if I gotta ex- explain this to one more person, that all there's externalities with everything, yeah, exactly. and gas prices are no different. You should always. I feel like in my mind, when I when I read something, I try to like I try to like jump it like. What's the like second, third ripple effect of said thing? Just think about you know everything I mean? like skipping a rock because it doesn't just stop right. where it happens. It, there's, and if it doesn't affect you specifically, maybe it might affect someone else. So it's not bad. To, you should care about things that maybe don't directly affect you. But in this case, um, it affects you for sure. Let's see when oil is under one hundred dollars a barrel, which is actually pretty good. It went under a hundred dollars a barrel. What was that yesterday? Yesterday it went under a hundred dollars a barrel. I mean, we got up to one hundred and thirty. So, if that was your stock graph, you'd be really happy at the top of it. <sighs> if somebody was trading oil futures, I guess they were happy. I don't know, um, but. I don't know. Maybe we'll see the prices start coming down again, but it's like you said, it's just going to be ripple effects. Um, Because like the thing is, is like there's still a lot of gas stations that had to buy barrels of oil at this price. And what was I reading the other day? Again, just you read something like you didn't give this more than you didn't give this sentence you typed more than eight seconds of thought. What was what they were saying? They were saying, well, if if it's one hundred and thirty dollars a barrel, they basically took the amount of gallons of gas that should be in a barrel of oil reproduced through a barrel of oil and then basically broke that down into like how much would that be per gallon yeah and here's what i'm paying per gallon and they're like why am i paying that much like corporate greed it's like <laughs> newsflash buddy someone has to refine it someone has to package it someone has to put that in the truck and drive it to you put it in the ground so you can go to a gas station that was built with someone's money and then put that gas in your car like the lack of thinking of like how many costs went into me getting this is like mind-boggling to me. And here's the thing. I and this isn't even a, an attack at like someone who it's not calling anyone stupid, but at the end of the day it's like I have this thing that if if you don't know something, then you shouldn't put like out an aggressive stance on it. Like if that guy just like took what took what he said and just didn't put out like hey, it's corporate greed, it's like you guys are wrong. Yeah. It wouldn't have been a big deal. You could he could just have been like, maybe I don't understand this. But everyone at, in this world has to have an opinion, and I guess like so do we because we're we're talking to people. But mm-hmm. I think it's also a good thing to not always feel like you have to have an opinion on everything. Right. Like, if you don't know something, I think it's totally acceptable and fine to be like, I just don't know. Yeah, I think more people probably should do that, myself included. It doesn't make have an but opinion. It doesn't make yourself. Like it doesn't that. make you stupid I don't know. if you don't know something. You just haven't learned it yet. So that's my perspective. On yeah, it. it's just I think that. Sometimes we have a very narrative-driven society, especially with social media and stuff like that. You're reading things a lot. And so I think it's like, I take this narrative and I apply it broadly to a lot of things. When like, for example, corporate greed. Does corporate, the, yes. does corporate greed exist? Of course. Yes. Is it is it probably more prevalent than it should be? Fair. But just to, just to like take things and just slap corporate greed, corporate greed, corporate greed on everything. It's like, it seems like... You're not critically thinking about the situation and like assessing whether that's actually what's happening or not. You're just saying it is a corporation, therefore it is corporate greed I mean, without like, doing any thought. Because I think like humans by nature in some ways are lazy. We like to outsource the things that don't require as a more monotonous tasks. We like to 
reduce the amount of friction in our buying decisions. We like to order something on Amazon, have it get delivered. Like we just which that went up in price, <laughs> right? <Well>, like <laughs> it did. <laughs> but like humans are just lazy by nature, I guess. So if it's something that you don't really feel like is worth your time or worth your energy, people just won't do it. And if they yeah. don't feel, and if they could just say it's corporate greed instead of going three layers deeper, it's like why wouldn't I just? In there, it's just why wouldn't I do that? It doesn't require more, more effort. Yeah, I wanted to uh, touch on this too. Um, Janet Yellen, there are beautiful secretary of the treasury um says that americans will likely see another year i think they're targeting the end of 2022 2023 um of uncomfortably high very uncomfortably high inflation um the last um labor department report had inflation at a 7.9 percent year over year um increase which is the highest since 1982 so um it's not slowing down. It isn't. It's not, in fact, transitory. And I think our your good friends here, at the SBE, might have said that a little while ago that we didn't feel Probably like it was a, a transitory. year and a half ago. Yeah, when they were saying the whole transitory thing, they were feeding you that lip service. I was like, I don't know if this is transitory. And sure enough, it does not look like it is. Um, so the report showed that the consumer price rose seven point nine percent in the past twelve months. And mind you, if you really t- like start breaking that down, which if you're interested in this topic, you definitely should, um, you'll see that there's some, there's certain markets where that number is like 20, 30%. So there are certain places where that inflation is a lot, lot higher than 7.9%. Um, and some of actually, the weird ones that are pulling that number down are the ones that tend not to be the ones that are stable. For example, like healthcare costs. Mm-hmm. Like we've had pretty like consistent growth in healthcare costs. Healthcare hasn't had a high inflation of costs recently. Maybe that's due to like subsidies and stuff like that. I don't know, but I thought that was interesting. Um, but yeah, I think it's. I think we're gonna keep talking about inflation on here because it's such an important topic to understand. And when it's at a number like eight percent year over year, it affects everybody with everything. Um, and kind of ignoring it, I don't think is really an option. And I think anyone who still is like, I'm not really sure how that all worked, you should watch the YouTube video we put out before on it, but you should also just dig more into that number because that's that's really important to you and it should affect, it should affect um, a lot of the ways that you make financial decisions. So I thought we should just bring that up again. We don't have to have a huge detailed conversation on it. Yeah. But No, I think 100%. You're right. It's probably the scariest thing that I would say the majority doesn't understand. Mm-hmm. So it's great to educate and like we're continuing to educate on ourselves on inflation and ways to combat it, but it's very, very important. And I think that the more you understand about inflation, you're only going to be better off. And I think people sometimes will be like, finances isn't really my thing, or I, I don't really like to be involved. And I, unfortunately, like this is a time where I think you do have to be involved, like very involved in just understanding. Because mm-hmm. then you can make better decisions and you can have someone help you make those decisions, but uh, you, it's definitely something that's worth the time. I completely agree. All right, guys. Well, thanks for sticking around for this episode. We hope you enjoyed the interview, and we appreciate you, and we'll see you next Wednesday. Later. See ya.